Good evening, good morning, and good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on the Torah day and night, so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit in its season, so that all we do will prosper. This is week 52 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Septuagint, and the Hebrew-English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra-canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we give praise and thanks to your great name. May you be glorified in all that we do. May your Ruach speak through us. And Father, be very cautious and may it be clear if we are to misspeak or to say something incorrect, may you point it out and show us. For we are all children that are learning your words and studying them as much as we can to share with others. May your blessing be upon this study. May you be opening the eyes and ears of all that watch and listen so that it may help them grow and develop further in your words. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are where the red arrow shows you today. That's week 52. We are going to deep dive into the Torah portion, which is Deuteronomy 32 through 34. Let's begin. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and let the earth hear the words of my mouth. May my teaching trickle like the dew, my words like rain showers on tender grass, and like spring showers on new growth. For I will proclaim the name of Yahweh, ascribe greatness to our God. The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just. He is a faithful God, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. They have behaved corruptly toward him. They are not his children. This is their flaw, a generation crooked and perverse. Like this do you treat Yahweh, foolish and unwise people. Has he not, your father, created you? He made you, and he established you. Remember the old days, the years long past. Ask your father, and he will inform you, your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High apportioned the nations, at his dividing up of the sons of humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples, according to the number of the sons of God. For Yahweh's portion was his people, Jacob the share of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, and in a howling desert wasteland. He encircled him, he cared for him. He protected him like the apple of his eye, as an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreads out its wings, takes them, carries them on its pinions. So Yahweh alone guided him, and there was no foreign god accompanying him. And he set him on the high places of the land, and he fed him the crops of the field, and he nursed him with honey from crags, and with oil from flinty rock, with curds from the herd, and with milk from the flock, with the fat of young rams, and rams, the offspring of Bashan and with goats along with the finest kernels of wheat, and from the blood of grapes you drank fermented wine. And Jeshurun grew fat, and he kicked, you grew fat, you bloated, and you became obstinate, and he abandoned God, his maker, and he scoffed at the rock of his salvation. They made him jealous with strange gods, with the testable things they provoked him. They sacrificed to the demons, not God, to gods whom they had not known, new gods who came from recent times, their ancestors had not known them. The rock who bore you, you neglected, and you forgot God, the one giving you birth. Then Yahweh saw, and he spurned them, because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. So he said, I will hide my face from them, I will see what will be their end. For they are a generation of perversity, children in whom there is no faithfulness. They annoyed me with what is not a God, they provoked me with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those not a people, with a foolish nation I will provoke them. For a fire was kindled by my anger, and it burned up to the depths of Sheol, and it devoured the earth and its produce, and it set afire the foundation of the mountains. I will heap disasters upon them, my arrows I will spend on them. They will become weakened by famine, and consumed by plague and bitter pestilence, and the teeth of wild animals I will send against them. With the poison of the creeping things in the dust, from outside her boundaries the sword will make her childless, and from inside, terror, both for the young man and also the young woman. 
the infant along with the gray-headed man. I thought, I will wipe them out. I will make people forget they ever existed. If I had not feared a provocation of the enemy, lest their foes might misunderstand, lest they should say, Our hand is triumphant. And Yahweh did not do all this, for they are a nation void of sense, and there is not any understanding in them. If only they were wise, they would understand this. They would discern for themselves their end. How could one chase a thousand and two could cause a myriad to flee if their rock had not sold them? And Yahweh had not given them up. For the fact of the matter is, their rock is not like our rock, and our enemies recognize this. For their vine is from the vine of Sodom, and from the terraces of Gomorrah, their grapes are grapes of poison. Their clusters are bitter, their wine is the poison of snakes, and the deadly poison of horned vipers. Is not this stored up with me, sealed in my treasuries? Vengeance belongs to me and also recompense, for at the time their foot slips, because the day of their disaster is near. And fate comes quickly for them, for Yahweh will judge on behalf of his people, and concerning his servants, he will change his mind when he sees that their power has disappeared. And there is no one left, confined or free. And he will say, Where are their gods, their rock in whom they took refuge? Who ate the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their libations? Let them rise up and let them help you. Let them be to you a refuge. See now that I, even I am he, and there is not a god besides me. I put to death and I give life. I wound and I heal. There is not one who delivers from my hand. For indeed I lift up my hand to heaven, and I promise as I live forever, when I sharpen my flashing sword, and my hand takes hold of it in judgment, I will take reprisals against my foes, and my haters I will repay. I will make my arrows drunk with blood, and my sword shall devour flesh with the blood of the slain, and captives from the heads of the leaders of the enemy. Call for songs of joy, O nations, concerning his people, for the blood of his servants he will avenge, and he will take reprisals against his foes, and he will make atonement for his land, his people. And Moses came, and he spoke all the words of this song in the ears of the people, that is, he and Joshua the son of Nun. And when Moses finished speaking all these words to all Israel, then he said to them, Take to heart all the words that I am admonishing against you today concerning which you should instruct them with respect to your children so that they will observe diligently all the words of this law. For it is not a trifling matter among you, but it is your life. And through this word you will live long in the land that you are about to cross the Jordan to get there to take possession of it. And Yahweh said to Moses on exactly this day, saying, Go up to this mountain of the Abarim range, Mount Nebo, which is opposite Jericho, and see the land of Canaan that I am giving to the Israelites as a possession. You shall die on that mountain that you are about to go up there, and you will be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor, and he was gathered to his people, because of the fact that he broke faith with me in the midst of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the desert of Zin because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the Israelites. Yes, from afar you may view the land, but there you shall not enter there, that is, into the land that I am giving to the Israelites. Before we start, I just wanted to share a few things. So I don't know if you paid attention to the colors, but this week for a change, we have a lot of red colors in the comparison that I, I made between say, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Masoretic text and also LXX and Masoretic text. Very interesting variants and Rob is going to explain expand more about those few verses. Because these three chapters are overloaded, chapter 32 is the famous song of Moses which Yahweh wrote and told Moses to read it to the Israelites. And then we have the blessing of Moses to Israel and each tribe in particular and then we are we have farewell from Moses. So there is a lot of stuff going on in this week portion. And since we are short on time, we couldn't dive into everything. So we are basically cherry picking this evening. And that's what you're going to hear next. So I'm going to touch on the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. Moses is a trip to writing two songs. And... The second song is the one here in Deuteronomy, and it's a song of warning, and I'll touch on that on the next slide. But the first song is a song of victory recorded in Exodus 15, 1 through 20. This is the first song mentioned in script by Moses, and this song is sung by Moses and the children of Israel, presumably the males, until Miriam and the women answered them, as we read. 
And here, the first song, Exodus 15, 1 through 20, presents itself as the song of Moses referred to in Revelation. So we see a tie-in with this first song in Exodus with Revelation 15. And that's the last recorded song is Revelation 15, which mentions as the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And here it is, 15, 1 through 4. And I saw another angel and marvelous sign in heaven, seven angels having seven plagues that are the last ones, because with them the wrath of Yahweh is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had prevailed over the beast and his image and the multitude of his name were standing near the glassy sea, holding harps from Yahweh. And they were singing the song of Moses, wow. the servant of Yahweh, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Yahweh Elohim Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who does not fear you, Yahweh, and glorify your name? For only you are holy, because all the nations will come and worship before you, because your righteous deeds have been revealed. From Revelation we see the seven last plagues of the seven messengers completes the wrath of Yah, like we see in the plagues of Egypt. The edge of the sea of glass that's mentioned, that is mixed with fire, the sea represents the nations of the earth. Fire representing judgment, trial, testing, refinement in scripture. In Exodus, they stood and watched as the sea swallowed up the enemy and they were seen no more. So it was a comparison of that in Revelation to that in Exodus. The victorious saints are not in the sea nor in the fire but are standing victorious on the edge of the sea, singing their song. I will keep you from the hour of trial because you have kept the faith and have not denied my name. In Exodus, we have a victory beside the Red Sea. We see that the song of Moses sung upon the deliverance from Egypt becomes the victory song upon overcoming the beast, his image and his name. It is the song resung for Yahweh provides our salvation. The second song in Deuteronomy 32, the Song of Moses, had both a prophetic purpose in predicting the nations falling away and a moralistic purpose in teaching the faithfulness of Yah and the consequences of sin. The song begins with a universal call to listen, followed by praise of the just, faithful, and upright Elohim. In contrast to Yah's faithfulness is Israel's unfaithfulness. The song proceeds to recite the history of Israel from their time of bondage in Egypt through their wilderness wanderings to their established place in the Promised Land. The Song of Moses then becomes prophetic. Israel's future in gratitude and idolatry are predicted, as are the judgments of Yah for their sins. Then Yah promises to avenge Israel against their enemies, showing compassion on his people. The song ends on a joyful note, a promise that Yah will make atonement for the, his land and people. Yah's punishment is passed, righteousness is restored, and the land of Israel cleansed. The song describes greatness in Yah. He is our rock. We talked about that. His work is perfect. All his ways are just, righteous, and upright. He is a faithful El. Interesting prophecy here mentioned in Deuteronomy 32, 23, and 36. I wanted to further discuss I will add misfortunes upon them to bring to an end with arrows or darts. They will become weakened by famine and consumed by plague and bitter pestilence and the teeth of wild animals I will send after them. With the poison slash rage of the serpents or reptiles in the dust from outside her boundaries, the sword, and that can be translated as tool or dart, will make her childless. Wow. And from inside, terror both for the young man and the young woman and the infant, along with the gray-haired man, I will blot out from among human beings their remembrance. And when I read it this way and look at each one of these words, when it talks about arrows... Could also mean darts. And I put in there a syringe and a needle. And I'm not here saying what that is, but it's always a possibility. What's going on even nowadays being used to bring this forth, this pestilence, plague, famine, and making women childless. And also from the inside, meaning from inner your inner side, your inner peace, 
becomes terror for the young men, women, infants, and elderly. So it's very interesting talking about this, quote, sword. So that could fit in what's going on now, but I don't know. It's something that, I, that you could read into with this, and I just wanted to put it out there as something for others to look at. And then Deuteronomy 30, verses 32 and 33. For their vine is from the vine of Sodom, and from the terraces of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of poison. And we talked about this in week 51, that poison being injustice and mistreatment. Their clusters are bitter. We talked about that in Wormwood being wickedness. Their wine is the poison of snakes and deadly poison of horned vipers. Once again, it's reiterating what I think the whole Wormwood and poison discussed in week 51 that we did a few chapters earlier. Another song mentioned in Enoch is referencing Yeshua or the Ruach HaKodesh. It just depends on how you want to read that one. Enoch 48.5 all who dwell on earth shall fall down and worship before him and will praise and bless and celebrate with song the Lord of Spirits. That's what I wanted to add to the Song of Moses, the first one and second one. And I thought some of the prophecies mentioned in, in this chapter is, can be very interesting depending on how you want to look at it. Next, I'm going to talk about in Deuteronomy's verse, 32 verses 7 and 8, the sons of God. So here we have, depending on your translation, it can say different things. So let me just say, I think as far as I know, all English translations follow the Masoretic except the Lexam. The Lexam comes from Dr. Michael Heiser, and he's the one that was group. big on it. So yes. that's why it matches this time. Yeah, yeah. So the verse I put up here is the, more or less a standard where it talks about, remember the old days, years long past. Ask your father, and he will inform you, your elders, and will tell you. When the Most High appointed the nations at his dividing up of the sons of humankind, he fixed the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the angels of God, the sons of God, and then what most English translations have tune that down to children of Israel. We see in the Septuagint, got them all here side by side. You got the Masoretic, the Septuagint, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I put each line that is comparative to the other, and you can see what is missing in the Masoretic compared to the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And you will see that it's talking about the angels of God and the sons of God. And we will talk about that further, whether that is the same thing or something different than angels of God. But here it's obviously stating these sons of God, the nations were distributed according to the sons of God. And I believe there's a number that's either 70 or 72, depending on which translation you want to pull from that too, of how the nations were all divided up on this earth. The sons of God, who are they? In Genesis 6, 2, the sons of God saw the daughters of humankind and they were beautiful and they took themselves wives from all that they chose. We know these were the 200 angels that came down unto Mount Hermon to help mankind. In Genesis 6-4, the Nephilim were upon the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God went into the daughters of humankind and they bore children to them. So right there we know that's referencing angels that came down into a fallen state or came to a fallen state. And in Job 1-6 1, and also in Job 2-1, and it happened one day that the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came into their midst. As an important spirit being, he, Satan, would have already been invited to any general meetings of all the spirit beings. So I put that in there because some people have a hard time thinking that Satan isn't allowed in heaven. Now, it all depends on how you want to look at heaven and what places. Where's the barrier before nothing can come into heaven. There's always a barrier, like a gate. There's a certain point where you would think that Satan would not be able to go beyond. But I'm going to talk about that a little bit further here, about this gate of where where he could go to. Now, Psalms 29.1, a psalm of David, ascribe to Yahweh, O sons of God, ascribe to Yahweh glory and strength. So here's David's talking about the sons of God ascribing glory to Yahweh. Luke 20, verses 34 to 36, And Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. 
for they are not even able to die any longer because they are like the angels and are sons of God because they are sons of the resurrection. So we see here that the sons of resurrection are sons of God. And to be a son of God, we would have to go through and be a son or child of the resurrection to more or less, how would you say that, to transform into being a son of God. And that's when we are, our bodies are glorified. Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers because they will be called sons of God. So we see peacemaking is a characteristic of a son of God. So I ascribe here or pull together sons of God are angels, as mentioned, and also are the sons of the resurrection. Those would classify as sons of God. What about Yeshua? Was he a son of God? One, John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and took up residence among us. And he saw his glory as the one and only, and that means sole child from the father full of grace and truth. We see that also in John 3, 16. 1 John 4, 9. By this, the love of God is revealed in us, that God sent his one and only Son into the world in order that we may live through him. Yeshua is specifically mentioned as the one and only Son, but there's also sons of God. And I'm probably going to touch on this in Genesis, but Yeshua is... A, is special. Yeah, so I just want to say that as far as I understand in Greek, the word that they used is not one and only, but one of a kind. And that's why I use the soul child, because when there's other sons of God, the way I would see that is all the sons of God are adopted. They're not directly from the seed. And, and that's how I see with the father and the son. He is a direct prodigy of the father, where we are brought into the family and adopted and transformed into the family of sons of God. So he is different in that way. Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus approached and spoke to them saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So he is different, not just in his birth, but also in the authority because he comes in the father's name with all authority. So he is, he's definitely different. Now I'm going to talk about the sons of God in the divine assembly. Psalm 82, 1 through 8, a psalm of Asaph. God stands in the divine assembly. He administers judgment in the midst of the gods. How long will you judge unjustly and show favoritism to the wicked? Selah. Judge on behalf of the helpless and the orphan and provide justice to the afflicted and the poor. Rescue the helpless and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They do not know or consider. They go about in darkness, so that all the foundations of the earth are shaken. I have said, you are gods and sons of the Most High, all of you. However, you will die like men, and you will fall like one of the princes, Satan. Rise up, O gods. And this is talking about the Elohim. Judge the earth because you shall inherit all the nations. And as you read into that, Yah is talking to these gods, this council, the ones that have been given out their portion of the nations, and it's that they aren't doing their job as they should be doing. Psalm 89, 5 through 7. And so the heavens will praise your wonderful deeds, O Yahweh, even your faithfulness in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the sky is equal to Yahweh? who is like Yahweh among the sons of God. A God feared greatly in the council of the holy ones, and awesome above all surrounding him, and awesome above all surrounding him. We see here that the sons of God surround him, but he is the most high God. And in Daniel 7, 9 through 10, I continue watching until thrones were placed and an ancient of days sat. His clothing was like white snow, and the hair on his head was like pure wool, and his throne was like flaming fire, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued forth from the flowing from his presence. Thousands upon thousands served him, and ten thousands upon ten thousand stood before him. The judge sat, and the books were open. So we see here, God is not the only one who has a throne. The sons of God also. But like I said, Yah is the Most High. 
Daniel 7, 25-26, And he, Antichrist, will speak words against the Most High, and he will wear out the Holy Ones of the Most High, and he will attempt to change times and the law, and he will give... He will be given into his hand for a time, and two times, and half a time. Then the court will sit, and his dominion will be removed, to be eradicated, and to be destroyed totally. The court, mentioned here, sits in judgment of the Antichrist. So we see here there is a court that sits. And I believe that is where this court is where the sons of Yah gather together, and make judgment and we'll see this further in Isaiah 14 13 to 14 and you he's talking to the fallen angels Satan and you yourself said in your heart I will ascend to heaven I will raise up my throne above the stars of God and I will sit which means rule on the mount of assembly on the summit of Zephon I will ascend to the highest places of the clouds I will make myself like the most high we see what Satan is saying here. And the Mount of Assembly may be a specific place of decision or judgment with spirit beings. As we are familiar with on earth, where the elders meet at the gate of the town for decisions and judgments. Remember, we read about that and we talked about that. People would go to the gate where the elders mm -hmm. would make judgments for whatever laws may have been broken, etc., and disputes. And so here, same thing. In the Mount of Assembly is where they gather to make decisions and judgment. We see this cultural use of high and low in Yeshua's parable of the wedding feast. Yeshua said, when you go to feast, take the lowest place. And when, you, when the host sees you there, he will say, friend, go up higher and higher, means closer to the host himself. If the devil could sit above the other thrones, then he would consider himself like the most high. Okay, and Jeremiah, I know I'm going fast, but Jeremiah 23, 16, 18, and then 21 and 22. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, you must not listen to the words of the prophets who prophesy to you. They are deluding you with visions of their mind. They do not speak from the mouth of Yahweh. They are continually saying to those who disregard the word of Yahweh, peace it will be to you. And to each one who walks in the stubbornness of his heart, they say, calamity will not come upon you. <laughs> for you have stood in the council of Yahweh. For oh, sorry. For who has stood in the council of Yahweh? That he has seen and heard his word. Who has listened attentively to his word and heard it? I have not sent the prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my council, they would have proclaimed my words to my people. And they would have caused them to turn from their evil ways and from their evil of their deeds. These verses clearly indicate that Yahweh has a council with whom he confers. And those who stand in the council hear the truth. God's prophets sometimes are given access to the information in those council meetings. Which is why they can speak the truth. Job 15, 8. Have you listened in on the counsel of God? And do you limit wisdom to yourself? Clearly, Eliphaz believed there was a divine counsel of God when he stated this, where the truth was spoken. And he asked Job if he had listened in on those council meetings. And in 1 Kings 22, 19 to 23, and he said, Therefore, hear the word of Yahweh. I saw Yahweh sitting on his throne with all the hosts of heaven standing beside him with his right hand and from his left hand. And Yahweh said, Who will entice Ahab so that he will go up and fall at Ramath Gilead? Then this one was saying one thing and this one was saying another. Then a spirit came out and stood before Yahweh and said, I will entice him. And Yahweh said to him, How? He said, I will go out and I will be a false spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Mm -hmm. And he said, you shall entice and succeed. Go out and do. So then see that Yahweh has placed a false spirit in the mouth of all of these, your prophets. And Yahweh has spoken disaster concerning you. We see here, God allows the spirit members of his council to decide how his decree 
that Ahab must die will be carried out. God has a counsel that he actively has participation and considers and allows these suggestions that are done in this counsel. Daniel 4, 13 to 14. I was looking in the vision of my head as I lay on my bed and look, a watcher and a holy one came down from heaven. He cried aloud and so he said, cut down the trees and chop off its branches, shake off its foliage and scatter its fruit. Let the animals flee from under it and the birds from its branches. Also in verses 17 and 23 and 25 of Daniel 7, the sentence is by the decree of the watchers and the decision by the command of the holy ones in order that the living will know that the most high is sovereign over the kingdom of humankind and to whomever he wills he gives it and even sets the humblest of men over it. And inasmuch that the king saw the watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven, and he said, Cut down the tree and destroy it, but the stump of its root in heaven leave with a band of iron and bronze in the grass of the field, and let it be watered with the dew of heaven, and let his lot be with the animals of the field until seven times have passed over him. This is the explanation, O king, and it is a decree of the Most High that has come upon my lord the king. You will be driven away from the human society and you will dwell with animals of the field and you will be caused to graze grass like the oxen yourself and you will be watered with the dew of heaven and seven periods of time will pass over until you have acknowledged that the Most High is sovereign over the kingdom of humankind and to whom he wills he gives it. So this decree of the watchers and the decision by the word of the holy ones is also called a, de a decree of the Most High. This shows that God is working with a council of spirit beings to make and enforce decrees. There's various ranks and powers in heaven and on earth. We see in Ephesians 6, 11, 6 12, because our struggle is not against blood and flesh, but against rulers, authorities, world rulers of the darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Colossians 1.16, because all things in the heavens and on earth were created by him, these visible and things invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things were created through him and for him. Genesis 1.26, and God said, let us make humankind in our image and according to our likeness. What ranking individuals do you think were included in us in Genesis 1.26? Our image and our likeness. Was it specific angels? Was it the Ruach HaKodesh, Holy Spirit? Was it Yeshua? I'll speak on that next week. Genesis 3.22. And Yahweh, God, said, Look, the man has become as one of us, to know good and evil. What if he stretches out his hand and takes also from the tree of life and eats and lives forever. So once again, Yahweh God said he might become like one of us. Genesis 11, 7. Come, let us go down and confuse their language. It's talking about Babylon. So that they may not understand each other's language. So there is us going down. That must have been the council. A few of them. Isaiah 6, 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Once again, this is the Lord saying this, who will go for us? And I do believe that this is the council speaking in for the council that makes the decisions. So God does not rule over his created beings as a tyrant, but works with them and allows them to help him govern his created universe. For example, God gave Adam and Eve rulership over the animals on the earth and the responsibility of managing his garden, the Garden of Eden. As the population on earth increased, God commanded mankind to appoint rulers and judges to help him rule. Yeshua also gives some as ambassadors, foretellers, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers for the edification of the body of Messiah, that in Ephesians. The biblical text shows that God holds large assemblies of his created beings, but also has smaller meetings with an intimate council of his high-ranking and trusted ones. We see this understanding played out in mythologies from this truth. We also see mythologies more or less playing off of this. 
But humans are not the only ones God allows to help him rule. It is clear that when God created the universe, he enlisted the help of various spirit beings to help him rule creation. There is good biblical evidence that God has a ruling council of spirit beings with whom he consults. He's giving an active participation from his creation. It's very telling. Hope it wasn't too quick and you got to absorb that, but I want to open it up for any questions or insights that you may have after presenting the Song of Moses and the Sons of God. So the Sons of God refer to within the Song of Moses, particularly refer to the watchers that came down to help humanity and the nations on earth were divided among those watchers but those watchers got corrupted and failed and ended up causing a lot of evil by teaching things that they were not supposed to teach and corrupting the human race. Yep, and it speaks to them that they mm -hmm. will be more or less yeah. punished like men. That was just beautiful summary and, and very that. comprehensive. I hope that gave some people insights if they weren't familiar with this concept that Yah has a council of gods. And don't get that confused that Yah is the Most High. And when we use the term gods, it's also referred to as angels. Angels are referred to as the sons of God. So they're just a higher spirit being. As we are the sons of Israel, they are the sons of God. There is no Israel for them. They are already more or less under the Father from the beginning, where we have come forth from the line or from the faith and understanding out of Israel. And then one day we will have our new transformed body and mind and become sons of the resurrection, being a son of God. I had a question. So which song of Moses would be the one spoken of in Revelation? Because I tried to follow you along and what you were saying, Rob. So just curious which one. Exodus 15, that song. That okay. one lines up with, yeah. with Revelation 15. So Exodus 15 and Revelation 15. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, I okay, know. It cool. is interesting. <clears throat> yeah, the Song of Moses from Exodus is a song of praise to Yah, so it makes more sense. That's the song that was... Instead of, that, uh, instead of the other one, and yeah, the second one. Of Moses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the second one from this week's poem is a song that Yah wrote and told Moses to read it to the nation. Yeah, and it's a song of warning, and it does have... A lot of prophecy. Pro prophetic yeah. judgment in it, too. So that's why, that's why I specifically pulled a verse talking about it that I thought was interesting to look at, verses 23 and to 26. So when it said the most unique son or whatever, the only son, whatever, so does that exclude the option for penitence to be in existence? I think that, recall going over that, I think that pe penitence is being hidden. I think it's if it's true that it would be a possibility only because it's always translated as only begotten son. So if the penitence thing is legit, then I would think that it's possible there's also a daughter, if that's so. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks. But once again, that's open to interpretation, but it could be a possibility. Deuteronomy chapter 33. Now this is the blessing with which Moses, the man of God, blessed the Israelites before his death. Then he said, Yahweh came from Sinai, and he dawned upon them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran. And he came with myriads of holy ones, at his right hand a fiery law for them. Moreover, he loves his people. All the holy ones were in your hand, and they bowed down to your feet. Each one accepted directions from you. A law Moses instructed for us as a possession for the assembly of Jacob. And then a king arose in Jeshurun at the gathering of the leaders of the people. United were the tribes of Israel. May Reuben live, and may he not die, and let his number not be few. And he said this of Judah, Hear, O Yahweh, the voice of Judah, and bring him to his people. His own hands strive for him, and may you be a help against his foes. And of Levi he said, Your Thummim and Urim are for your faithful one, whom you tested at Massa. You contended with him at the waters of Meribah. The one saying of his father and of his mother, I have not regarded them. And his brothers he did not acknowledge, and his children he did not know. But rather they observed your word, and your covenant they kept. 
They taught your regulations to Jacob and your law to Israel. They placed incense smoke before you and hold burnt offerings on your altar, lest smite the loins of those who attack him and those hating him so that they cannot arise. Of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of Yahweh dwells securely, the most high shields all around him all the day, and between his shoulders he dwells. And of Joseph he said, Blessed by Yahweh is his land, with the choice things of heaven, with dew, and with the deep lying down beneath, and with the choice things of the fruits of the sun, and with the choice things of the yield of the seasons, and with the finest things of the ancient mountains, and with the choice things of the eternal hills, and with the choice things of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of the one who dwelt in the bush. Let them come to the head of Joseph, and to the crown of the prince among his brothers. As the first horn of his ox, majesty belongs to him, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. With them he drives people together, and they are the myriads of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. And of Zebulun he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out, and rejoice, Issachar, in your tents. They summon people to the mountains, there they sacrifice the sacrifices of righteousness, because the affluence of the seas they suck out and the most hidden treasures of the sand. And of Gad he said, Blessed be the one who enlarges Gad, like a lion he dwells, and he tears an arm as well as a scalp. And he selected the best part for himself, for there the portion of a ruler is included. And he came with the heads of the people. He did the righteousness of Yahweh and his regulations for Israel. And of Dan he said, Dan is a cub of a lion. He leaps from Bashan. And of Naphtali he said, O oh, Naphtali, sated of favor and full of the blessing of Yahweh, take possession of the lake and the land to the south. And of Asher he said, Blessed more than sons is Asher. May he be the favor of his brothers, dipping his feet in the oil. Your bars are iron and bronze, and as your days, so is your strength. There is no one like God, O oh, Jeshurun, who rides through the heavens to your help, and with his majesty through the skies. The God of ancient time is a hiding place, and underneath are the arms of eternity, and he drove out from before you your enemy. And he said, Destroy them. So Israel dwells alone and carefree, the spring of Jacob in a land of grain and wine. His heavens even drip dew. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people who is saved by Yahweh, the shield of your help, and who is the sword of your triumph, and your enemies, they shall fawn before you, and you shall tread on their backs. In the PDF, there is a few differences between the Septuagint and Masoretic, and we highlighted those in the significant levels, and there are some things that are not in the Septuagint that are there. Take a look at those, but nothing of significance to talk about necessarily. All right, quickly, I'll get a short one here on 33, and, and then I'm done. In verses 2 to 3, I'm talking about the final blessing on Israel mentioned here. And then he said, Yahweh came from Sinai, and he dawned upon them from Seir. He shone forth from Mount Paran, and he came with myriads of holy ones, at his right hand a fiery law with them. Moreover, he loves his people. All the holy ones were in your hand, and they bowed down to your feet. Each one accepted direction from you. So Yah always has his angels at work. They're always, whether if they're not praising him consistently, they're doing his work that he orchestrates to be done. Deuteronomy 33, 28 through 29. So Israel dwells alone and carefree, the spring of Jacob in the land of grain and wine. His heaven even drips dew. Blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people who is saved by Yahweh, the shield of your help, and who is the sword of your triumph and your enemies. They shall fawn before you, and you shall tread on their backs. Now we look at the... Now we look at the prophesied future of Israel after they fall away. Zechariah chapter 8, 11, and 12. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people, as in the former days, declares Yahweh of hosts. For there will be a sowing of peace. The vine will give its fruit, and the soil will give its produce, and the heavens will give its dew. And I will cause the remnant of this people to inherit all things. We see this tied in, this prophecy in Deuteronomy 33 with Zechariah 8. Yah provides salvation and outlines the rewards for obedience. We see this throughout and throughout the scriptures. That Yah has salvation and he's always warning his people from doing wickedness. And as they do wickedness, he punishes them. 
And it's not until they turn and repent from their wickedness can the blessings even start, or should I say the curses stop. So that's what I had. Okay. What caught my attention was the elusive logic of Moses' blessing. Chapter 33 is a classic example of a chapter that every religious Jew knows by heart, but almost no one really understands. The reasons for this are clear. Many words are difficult to understand, and it is very difficult to follow the fast flow of the chapter. Let's start with the first two problems in studying the blessing. The tribe of Simeon does not receive a blessing at all. The order of the tribes is in giving the blessing seem quite random. To fully understand the problem, here is a table which shows the order of the tribes in our chapter compared to the order of their birth. So, we start with Reuben. So far, so good. He was also the firstborn. But then, from that moment on, everything goes bananas. Judah is number two, but in the order of birth, is number four. Levi, number three, matches. Benjamin, number four, but he was the last one to be born, number 12. Five is Joseph, he was the 11th one to be born, and so on. As you can tell, it's, it looks like a big mess. You would think that Moses would follow the order of Barrett, but he didn't. But beyond it, it looks like there is no sense whatsoever to the order given by Moses. So let's explore it. Although it is easy to understand why Reuben, the eldest, is blessed first, why skip straight to Judah? And why does Benjamin appear before Joseph, his older brother? And why do Rachel's son get stuck in the middle of Leah's son? And why Zebulun before Issachar? The arrangement in the sons of the handmaids group is also puzzling. The sons of Bilhah separate the sons of Zilpah, and the younger God precedes Dan and Naphtali, who are older than him. In conclusion, although the list is apparently not random, as evidenced by the separation between the sons of the women and the sons of the slaves, it is difficult to understand according to what logic it is arranged. To reveal the elusive logic in, Mos in Moses' blessing, I am proposing that the blessings are related to the imminent con conquest and settlement of the promised land, and as a result, most likely reflect the following points or some of them. First, the conquest of the land and different aspects of the conquest, the nature of the estate that the tribe will receive, and third, the role of the tribe in the leadership of the people in the future. So let's briefly review the main content of the blessings. And I have a map of all of the tribes. And the map will uh, help you follow my explanation. So Reuben. The blessing to Reuben is, May Reuben live and may he not die, and let his number not be few. This blessing came as a response to the fear that the tribe of Reuben would not receive an inheritance at all following his sin with Bilhah, for which Jacob reprimanded him instead of blessing him and even deprived him of his birthright. Basically, Reuben lost his rights to a double portion as firstborn. Jacob transferred the double portion to Joseph instead, who didn't receive any land allotment directly. His two sons received their father's land portion. And reminding you in Genesis, when Jacob was out of town, Reuben slept with his Cuban, concubine Bilhah. And that was his sin. Furthermore, the settlement of the tribe past the eastern Jordan outside the borders of the land of Canaan is a significant factor. Another possibility here is that since the tribe of Reuben volunteered to pass as vanguards in the war of conquest of the land, Moses blessed them that they would not die in the war. Judah. 
And he said this to, of Judah, Hear, O Yahweh, the voice of Judah, and bring him to his people. His own, his own hands strive for him, and may you be a help against his foes. This blessing undoubtedly refers to the war of conquest of the land because Moses knows that the members of the tribe of Judah will be eager to conquer their land. Levi. And of Levi he said, and now we have quite a few verses unlike the previous ones. And of Levi he said, Your Tumim and your Urim are for your faithful one whom you tested at Massah. You contended with him at the waters of Meribah, the one saying of his father and of his mother, I have not regarded them, and his brothers he did not acknowledge, and his children he did not know, but rather they observed your word and your covenant they kept. They taught your regulations to Jacob and your law to Israel. They placed incense smoke before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Bless, O Yahweh, his substance, and with the work of his hands you must be pleased. Smite the loins of those who attack him and those hating him so that they cannot rise. The blessing of the tribe of Levi refers mainly to its role in the spiritual leadership of the people, teaching Torah and serving in the temple. But even in describing this role, Moses uses the borrowed phrase from the word of war, troops. Note the allusion in verse 9 to the willingness of the Levites to kill the sinners in the sins of the calf, a function of a military nature by all accounts. Since the tribe of Levi is not going to receive its own land in the land, but to be dispersed in different cities within the lands of the other tribes, it is clear why there is no reference to the land in his blessing. Benjamin. Of Benjamin he said, The beloved of Yahweh dwells securely, the Most High shields all around him all the day, and between his shoulders he dwells. This blessing refers to the special nature of the land of the tribe of Benjamin, where the temple will be built. Joseph, the longest blessing, and of Joseph he said, Blessed by Yahweh is his land with the choice things of heaven, with dew and with the deep lying down beneath, and with the choice things of the fruits of the sun, and with the choice things of the hills of the season, and with the finest things of the ancient mountains, and with the choice things of the eternal hills, and with the choice things of the earth and its fullness, and the favor of the one who dwelt, dwelt in the bush. Let them come to the head of Joseph and to the crown of the prince among his brothers. As the firstborn of his ox, majesty belongs to him, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox. With them he drives people together, and they are the myriad of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Menasheh. The blessing is difficult verbally. In any case, it is clear that the inheritance of the tribes of Joseph will be especially rich and fertile, and that they will probably have to support the other tribes, similar to Joseph's roles in Egypt. The last verses describe the military power of the tribes of Joseph and their ability to attack other nations. Zebulun and Isis. And of Zebulun he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out, and rejoice, Issachar, in your tents. They summon people to the mountains. There they sacrifice the sacrifices of righteousness, because the affluence of the seas they suck out, and the most hidden treasures of the sand. The beginning of the blessing perhaps alludes to military strength, while its end focuses on the nature of the land, which will be a place for a central port. The sea route is a source of economic contact with other nations, and Moses hopes that with time such a relationship will be able to lead other people to recognize the God of Israel, one of the important goals of choosing the people of Israel. Also, in the estate of the tribe of Issachar, there is a potential for contact with other people since it is located in the Jezreel Valley on the ancient road between Egypt and Mesopotamia. 
God. And of God he said, blessed be the one who enlarges God like a lion he dwells and he tears an arm as well as a scalp and he selects the best part for himself for there the portion of a ruler is included and he came with the heads of the people he did the righteousness of Yahweh and his regulations of Israel. God's blessing also refers to the nature of his property and his military prowess. He was the tribe of God basically was considered the fiercest warrior of all of the tribes. And for several years now, I've been suspecting that maybe the Goths are actually descendants of God. The end of the blessing is difficult and it probably refers to Moses' burial place. Dan. And of Dan he said, Dan is a cub of a lion, he leaps from Bashan. Here too there is a reference to the military capability as well as the location of the estate. Naphtali and of Naphtali he said, O oh, Naphtali, sated of favor and full of the blessing of Yahweh, take possession of the lake which is the Sea of Galilee and the land to the south. True to the blessing above from Moses, the tribe of Naphtali settled in northern Canaan in the high regions west and northwest of the Sea of Galilee. Of the twelve tribes of Israel, none received land more beautiful than this tribe. Their inheritance fell in the region of Galilee, centered around the shores of the Sea of Galilee. This tribe possessed the most fertile and productive region in all of Canaan. Together with the tribes of Dan and Asher, the tribe of Naphtali was responsible for ensuring the tribes of Israel were not surprised attacked from the rear as they marched in the wilderness the tribes would have been vulnerable to attack the fiercest of warriors and toughest of warriors were primarily placed in the rear guard in order to prevent a devastating rear attack this blessing alludes to beauty might and strength Asher. And of Asher he said, Blessed more than sons is Asher. May he be the favorite of his brothers, dipping his feet in oil. Your bars are iron and bronze, and as your day, so is your strength. Washing one's feet in oil was a sign of prosperity, as we learned also in the New Testament, and Jacob's reference to Asher, Asher's food being rich indicated that Asher would possess fertile lands. In Joshua, we learned that Asher received land along the Mediterranean coast. Last, Simeon, no blessing. The omission of Simeon from Moses' final blessing of the tribes of Israel was a reflection or fulfillment of Jacob's final pronouncement regarding his son Simeon and Levi and their descendants in Genesis 49, in which Jacob recalled the violence that Simeon and Levi had used in avenging the rape of their sister Dina by Shechem, the Hivite in Genesis 34, which as Jacob said in rebuking them at the time had caused Jacob and his entire family to be repug repugnant to the people living in the promised land. In addition, he had a paramount role in what happened to Joseph. I personally believe Simeon is also punished severely for his deep jealousy of Joseph and his plot to kill him with no mercy towards his brother nor his father. Here is what Simeon told his children on his deathbed in the testament of Simeon. For in the time of my youth I was jealous in many things of Joseph because my father loved him beyond all. And I set my mind against him to destroy him, because the prince of the seed sent forth the spirit of jealousy and blinded my mind, so that I regarded him not as a brother, nor did I spare even Jacob my father. But his God and the God of his father sent forth his angel and delivered him out of my hands. 
the omission of Simeon was also a foreshadowing of the manner in which that tribe's allocation of the promised land would be taken completely from the portion allocated to Judah, rather than being a separate section of its own. However, while Simeon was omitted from Moses' final blessing, Levi was included because of the absolute loyalty the Levites showed to Yah during the Golden Calf incident. Levi was to be the designated priestly tribe of Israel, but like Simeon, the Levites also did not have a separate portion of the promised land allocated to them since they were to be devoted wholly to leading the people in worship of the Lord and would be sustained by the people's offerings to Yah, rather than working the land and living off its produce. So when you look at the map, you can see that Simeon, tri Simeon inheritance was within the tribe of Judah. That's in the dark pink. Something else I want to point out is that Simeon and Levi, as you just mentioned, neither one of them get a yeah. plot of land. Yeah. And, so and neither it, one of them get a plot of land. Yeah, and, and, and it fits with Jacob prophecy exactly. because Jacob told them that they will not... Yeah. yeah very interesting. Okay, so let me summarize, <laughs> making sense of the seeming mess. Since the blessings mainly deal with estates, they are arranged according to the order of estates. So it's not messy after all. So basically the order that the blessings are showing are the order that the land was captured. Okay? So the blessings begin with the tribe of Reuben, not because he is the, old, the eldest, but because he was the first to take an estate, as recounted in Numbers 32. After the blessing to the tribe of Reuben, one might expect a blessing to the tribe of God, whose inheritance came east of the Jordan. But since the sons of Leah and the sons of Rachel are blessed separately from the sons of the handmaids, the tribe of God was moved from its place. And anyway, it is now understood why God proceeded then within the group of the sons of the handmaids, even though Dan is older, because he took possession before the tribe of Dan. Judah at the head, after the skipping over God, Moses gives blessing to the tribe of Judah, which was the first tribe to successfully conquer its land. After the blessing to the tribe of Judah, Moses moved north according to the settlements through Benjamin to Ephraim and Manasseh. Now it perhaps makes sense why the tribe of Simeon, whose property is enclosed within the borders of the land of Judah, is skipped. Moses continues to advance north to the tribes of Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh, whose territory extends between the sea and the Jordan and includes all the mountains of Samaria. North of the tribes of Joseph live Issachar and Zebulun, Zebulun to the west and Issachar to the east. Although there is no geographical reason to place Zebulun ahead of his older brother Issachar, and it is possible that Moses is simply acting as Jacob did in his time in his blessing to the tribes. Moses blesses the sons of the handmaid only after he has finished blessing the sons of Leah and Rachel. The blessing of the sons of the handmaids also come in the order of their estates. First God who took his estate beyond the Jordan after him Dan and Naphtali whose estate lie north of the estate of Issachar and Zebulun. And the last one is Asher who sat along the northern border of the land of Israel. So mystery solved. <laughs> this also implies that even though they would draw lots, reminding you that the tribes had to draw lots, and that's how they chose their estates. So this imp implies that even though they would draw lots, Moses knew in advance what the results would be. Blessings are preceded by a four-verse opening followed by closing verses. The opening verses describe the status of Mount Sinai and the role of Moses as mediator in giving the Torah to the people of Israel, while the closing verses describe Yah's protection of Israel and his help against the enemy. 
These verses form an adequate framework for the speech since they actually repeat the main essence of the book of Deuteronomy and to a certain extent of the Torah as a whole. Yah chose Israel to represent him in the world and for this purpose he is going to give them the land where they should live according to the Torah. At the end of his journey Moses blesses Israel that Yah will help them conquer the land in order to fulfill their destiny in it. Wow, now we know. Now we know, yeah. <laughs> Took a little bit mystery cracking here. Any thoughts, any questions regarding chapter 33? Excellent, excellent. It's amazing. Pam, I think in between the noise, I heard you thanking me and uh, saying that you really appreciate. Lovely. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So we are, we will proceed with chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, Then Moses went up from the desert plateau of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And Yahweh showed him all of the land, Gilead all the way up to Dan, and all of Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, and all of the land of Judah, up to the western sea, and the Negev and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, on up to Zor. And Yahweh said to him, This is the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross into it. Then Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died there in the land of Moab according to the command of Yahweh. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. But until this day no one knows his burial site. Now Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died. His sight was not impaired and his vigor had not abated. And the Israelites wept concerning Moses' thirty days. Finally the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were completed. Now Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had placed his hands on him. And the Israelites listened to him, and they did as Yahweh had commanded Moses. And not again has a prophet arisen in Israel like Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face, as far as all the signs and the wonders Yahweh set him to do in the land of Egypt, against Pharaoh and all of his servants, and against all of his land, and as far as all of the mighty deeds, and as far as the great awesome wonders Moses did before the eyes of all Israel. As I told you last week, 10 days ago, I gave a sermon to a church in East Texas and the sermon was inspired by this Torah portion. So I decided to put the sermon into a few slides and just share it with you because I feel that it's very profound. Why Moses didn't enter the promised land and I finally understand what my grandma used to tell me. So let's look at two, two of the chapters from this week portion. Chapter 32, go up to this mountain of the Abarim range, Mount Nevo, which is opposite Yericho, and see the land of Canaan that I am giving to the Israelites as a possession. You shall die on that mountain that you are about to go up there, and you will be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor, and he was gathered to his people. Because of the fact that you broke faith with me in the midst of Israel, at the waters of Meribah Kadesh, in the desert of Zin, because you did not treat me as holy in the midst of the Israelites. Yes, from afar you may view the land, but there you shall not enter there, that is, into the land that I am giving to the Israelites. And then chapter 34. Then Moses went up from the desert plateau of Moab to Mount Nevo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Yericho. And Yahweh showed him all of the land, Gilad, all the way up to Dan, and all of Naphtali, and the land of Ephraim, and Menashe, and all of the land of Judah up to the western sea, and the Negev, and the plain of of the valley of Yericho, the city of Palms, on up to Zoar. And Yahweh said to him, This is the land that I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, To your offspring I will give it. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross into it. 
Then Moses, the servant of Yahweh, died there in the land of Moab according to the command of Yahweh. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab opposite Beth Peor. But until this day, no one knows his burial site. The name of the ceremonies is Faith and Words. Reflections on, on why Moses was not allowed to enter the promised land that finally explained to me what my grandma taught me many years ago. She always used to tell me, Child, always be careful of what you say. Whatever your mouth utters out, a voice in heaven will say, and so it is. For the longest time, I was bothered by the fact that Yah didn't allow Moses into the promised land. I sympathized with Moses in his one moment of weakness, and I wondered if Yah judged him too harshly. I was also bothered by the fact that I was bothered. It's not good to stay in a place where you criticize Yah's judgment or question his character. Whenever you read the Bible and find your sensibilities don't line up with how Yah is described, you face a choice. You can reject Yah's ways and stand in judgment over him, or you can submit to Yah's ways and ask him to transform your sensibilities until they are more in line with his word. So I prayed for wisdom and discernment regarding this passage of the Bible. And I was reminded once more that sometimes the areas where Yah most offends us are the areas where we most need to grow. The examples written in the Old Testament are there so that we can learn not to repeat the same mistakes that our forefathers and spiritual leaders made. If we can learn these lessons from Moses, <coughs> I think we can apply them to our situ situations today. So join me on this short journey of examining what kept Moses out of entering Yah's promised land. In the book of Numbers, chapter 20, Moses was facing a big problem again. He was attempting to lead the, pe the people of Israel through the wilderness. There was little to no water to drink, and the people at the, and the animals were all very thirsty. Numbers 20, 1 through 5. Then the entire community of the Israelites came to the desert of Zin on the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh. Miriam died and was buried there. There was no water for the community, and they were gathered before Moses and Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we died when our brothers were dying before Yahweh. Why have you brought the assembly of Yahweh, us and our livestock, into this desert to die here? Why have you brought us from Egypt to bring us to this bad place? It is not a place of seed or figs or vines or pomegranate trees, and there is no water to drink. Moses turned to Yah and asked for help, and Yah responded with a set of specific instructions. Numbers 26 through 7. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of assembly. They fell on their faces, and the glory of Yahweh appeared to them. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Now let's see what Yah said to Moses. Numbers 28 through 13. Take the staff and summon the community, and you and Aaron your brother, and speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will give water. Bring out for them water from the rock, and let the community and their livestock drink. Yah gave Moses a very specific set of instructions with a limited number of steps, five steps to be precise. Take your rod, one, two, 
Get your brother Aaron. 3. Gather the people before the rock. 4. Speak to the rock. 5. Give everyone a drink. These are not complicated steps, right? But yet, people sometimes hear what they want to hear instead of what Yah says to them. And that gets them into trouble in a very big way. As we read through the rest of this chapter, we find that Moses did not do what Yah told him to do. Five little things Yah told Moses to do. Five little specific steps of instructions from Yah. Was this complicated? No. Was this different? Yes. Yah had never give the, given these instructions to Moses before. So maybe Moses had a struggle with them, or maybe Moses just assumed he knew what Yah had said. Maybe he heard in his mind something different. I don't know. I can't pretend to know Moses' mind. What I do know is what I learned from observing the instructions of Yah. Yah rarely repeats exactly what he told you to do before. Almost 40 years earlier, in Exodus 17, Moses encountered a semi-similar scenario, but that time it involved the parents and grandparents of the generation referred to in Numbers 20. Let's read it together. Exodus 17, 1-6 And all the community of the Israelites set out from the desert of Zin. Wait a moment, this is the same location. For their journeys according to the command of Yahweh, and they camped in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. And the people quarreled with Moses, and they said, Give us water so that we can drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test Yahweh? And the people thirsted for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why ever did you bring us up from Egypt to kill us and our son and our cattle with thirst? Sounds familiar? And Moses cried out to Yahweh, saying, What will I do with these people? A little longer and they will stone me. And Yahweh said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some from the elders of Israel. And the staff with which you struck, strike the Nile, take in your hand and go. Look, I will be standing before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you will strike the rock, and water will come out from it, and the people will drink. If Yah told you to strike the rock last time, then guess what? This time you will probably be asked to do something different. Why? To Yah the hidden things belong. Remember last week's Torah portion, Deuteronomy 29.29. 29. The hidden things belong to Yahweh our Yah, but the revealed things belong to us to know and to our children forever in order to do all the words of this law. So back to Numbers 20. Yah gives Moses a very specific set of instructions with a limited number of steps. Take your rod, get your brother Aaron, gather the people before the rock, speak to the rock, give everyone a drink. Let's read through the next verses to examine what Moses actually did. Numbers 29 through 11. So Moses took the staff from before Yahweh, just as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron summoned the assembly to the presence of the rock. And he said to them, Listen, you rebels, can we bring out water for you from this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, and abundant water went out, and the community and their livestock drank. So Moses makes a great start to obeying Yah, but a really lousy ending. Here are the steps Moses took. Moses took the road, check. Moses met with his brother Aaron, check. 
Moses and Aaron gather the people together before the rock check. Moses then said to the people, Moses lifted his hand, Moses smote the rock, Moses smote the rock again. Moses gave everyone a drink check. The first three steps seem to be perfect matches to the instructions that Yah gave to Moses. However, Moses omits one step from Yah's five-step plan, speak to the rock, and instead adds four of his own steps. When did Yah ever tell Moses to say anything to the people? I'm sure he had to say something to them to assemble them before the rock, but when did Yah tell Moses to speak to the people after they were all gathered together? Did Yah tell Moses to preach to the people? Did Yah say to tell to the people anything at all? I don't think so. And when did Yah tell Moses to raise his hand or strike the rock? Not once, but twice. Remember, as soon as we start deviating from Yah's plan, even just a tiny deviation, we begin to miss it. And next, we fall into disobedience. And that's exactly what happened to Moses. He fell into disobedience. In verse 12, we learn of Yah's response. But Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, Because you have not trusted in me to regard me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this assembly into the land that I have given to them. Yah reveals that at the core of Moses' disobedience, Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock, is lack of faith. Apparently Moses had a problem with speaking to an inanimate object and expecting anything to transpire from merely, merely spoken words. Yah was trying to teach his servant Moses a spiritual lesson, namely, that words have authority and power behind them. On a previous occasion in Exodus 17, Yah had told Moses to strike the rock to bring out water for the people. But this time, Yah changed the plan. If you did not realize it, Yah hardly ever does the same thing twice. According to Yah's instructions, this time, Moses was supposed to speak to the rock before the people. So while the people were watching, the people would have learned a valuable spiritual lesson also. Words have authority and power behind them. But Moses failed, and as a result, Yah told him that he would not enter with the people into the promised land. But this is just the beginning of the lesson. We need to also pay attention to the symbolism in this story. Who did the Bible say the rock is? Let's see. Actually, during the Moses blessing in chapter 33, every, almost every verse he referred to Yah as the rock. Let's look at it. 1 Samuel 2.2 there is no one holy Yahweh, for there is no one besides you, and there is no rock like our Yah. 2 Samuel 22.3 I take refuge in Yah, my rock, my shield, and the strength of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. O oh, my Savior, you will save me from violence. 2 Samuel 22.32 For who is Yah apart from Yahweh? And who is a rock apart from our Yah? Isaiah 26, 4. Trust in Yahweh forever, for in Yah, Yahweh, you have an everlasting rock. Psalms 18, 2. Yahweh is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my Yah, my rock, in whom I have taken refuge, my shield and the horn of my deliverance, my stronghold. 
Psalm 62, 7, on Yah rest my salvation and my glory. Yah is my strong rock, my refuge. And what does living water represent in the Bible? Jeremiah 17, 13, O Yahweh, the hope of Israel, all those who forsake you will be put to shame, and those who turn aside from you in the earth will be recorded, for they have forsaken the fountain of living water, Yahweh. John 4, 13-14 Yeshua answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of this water which I will give to him will never be thirsty for eternity, but the water which I will give to him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. John 7, 37, 38 Yeshua stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and let him drink, the one who believes in me. Just as the scripture said, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Isaiah 44, 3 For I will pour out water on a thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit out on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. So what was the first thing that Moses did that was not on Yah's instruction list of five specific steps? If you recall, the downfall came when he started talking to the people. This is a critical lesson for us to take note of. Moses had a problem. The people were thirsty, which caused them to be rebellious. Yah provided the answer to Moses. Speak to the rock, and the people will get what they need, living water. Instead of speaking the answer, Moses spoke the problem. And everything went downhill from that. Yah was trying to teach Moses a spiritual lesson concerning speaking the answer. And Moses chose to speak the problem instead. Wow, did you just hear what I said? This is a critical lesson to learn and apply to our situations today. Yah never said to speak to the people. And speaking to the people who were the problem was not going to bring Moses the answer. Speaking to his problem and admonishing them that they are his problem would cause them to continue as they were and they would remain his problem because of his words spoken over them. The people of Israel didn't learn any lessons from this experience. Yah told Moses that he was not going to lead the people into the promised land because of his lack of faith in Yah and the answer provided by Yah and disobedience thereof. Here is what the Bible says about Moses. Deuteronomy 34, 10 through 12. And not again as a prophet arisen in Israel like Moses, whom Yahweh knew face to face. As far as all the signs and the wonders Yahweh sent him to do in the land of Egypt, against Pharaoh and all of his servants, and against all of his land, and as far as all of the mighty deeds, and as far as the great awesome wonders Moses did before the eyes of all Israel. That was Moses, revered in both the Old and New Testament, and rightly. He was chosen by Yah for a particular mission. He was humble. He was faithful. He, le he listened carefully and then obeyed what Yah told him to do again and again, except for this one time. Thus coming short of the destiny that Yah had intended for him. Moses left behind a great legacy for us all, but he also left us a legacy in the many lessons we can learn from his experiences and relationship with Yah. 
Can you see how his example of failure applies to you and can it help you not to repeat his mistake? If you can, it will radically change what you say to who and when. Many times it would be better to keep silent and not say anything than to speak the problem. Mm -hmm. Remain in unbelief and miss out on Yah's answer to your problem. Amen. Yah told Moses that if he would only speak to the rock, that the rock would obey his words. If you study the Bible and what it says about the words that you speak, you would certainly change many of the things that you say. Earlier in the book of Numbers, Yah revealed two things to Moses and Israel that have a direct bearing on everything that I just said about Moses. It would be unjust if Yah punished Moses for doing something that Yah had not taught him before. In Numbers 6, Yah told Moses the following. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to Aaron and his son saying, You will bless the Israelites. You will say to them, Yahweh will bless you and keep you safe. Yahweh will shine his face on you and be gracious to you. Yahweh will lift up his face upon you and he will give you peace and they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. Yah concluded with, and I will bless them. Here is the principle given. You speak blessings, and I will bless them. Did you get that concept? Yah taught Moses and Aaron that they could bless Israel with the words that came out of their mouth. By them speaking these words over the people, Yah was able to bless them and cause them to prosper. That is exactly the opposite of what Moses said and did. Moses looked at the people and angrily admonished them, calling them rebels. Can Yah bless these words? No. What actually transpired instead is that Moses ended up cursing his own people with his own words and that is a major problem. Yah could not bless Israel because Moses did not follow the instructions of Yah and what Yah taught him about the power of words. To drive this point home, six chapters earlier than the Speak to the Rock chapter, in Numbers 20, Yah told Moses something that is very hard not to understand. Numbers 14.28 Say to them, Surely as I live, declares Yahweh, just as you spoke in my ears, so I will do to you. Just as you spoke in my ears, so I will do to you. Yah reveals to Moses a spiritual law concerning the words that he speaks. This spiritual law applies across the board to all the people as well as the leadership. Yah tells Moses, I will do whatever you say. This verse tells me that Yah listens to the words that come out of my mouth. Whatever I say, that is what Yah will do to me. I know most believers have a hard time believing this, but this is what Yah said. I didn't invent this. There are many other Bible verses that confirm what I have just said. You can study them for yourselves, or you can simply ignore them all and think they do not apply to you. But here are a few of them. Psalms 55, 17. Morning, noon, and night I will speak and groan loudly, and he will hear my voice. Psalms 139, 4. For there is not a word yet on my tongue, but behold, O Yahweh, you know it completely. Second Chronicle, Chronicles 7, 14. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and will pray and will seek my face and will turn from their evil ways, then I myself shall hear from the heavens and will forgive their sins and heal their land. 
1 John 5.15 And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked for him, from Him. Here is a confirmation from the book of Psalms that Moses' words were at the core of his disobedience. Psalms 106.32-33 They also angered Yah at the waters of Meribah, and it went badly for Moses on account of them, because they rebelled against and bittered his spirit, and he, Moses, spoke thoughtlessly with his lips. In these verses, Yah tells us that the children of Israel angered Moses, by making him angry, we are informed that he was provoked to speak unadvisedly with his lips. You can clearly see from this verse that it was Moses' thoughtless words and not him striking the rock that was the problem. This is an extremely valuable lesson to see and to learn from. Yah tells us that he is listening to what we say and that he will do to us whatever we say. If we speak evil, that is what we will get. If we speak good things, that is also what we will get. If we speak the problem, we will get more of the problem. Mm. If we speak the answer, we will get a solution for our problems. Our words affect our outcome and what we get. Because the children of Israel murmured and complained to Yah about their situation, that is what they got. Remember, the older generation did not enter into the promised land, except for Joshua and Caleb. What made Joshua and Caleb different? What caused Joshua and Caleb to enter where the other people their age all died? I implore you to go back and read that story very closely and see what Joshua and Caleb said when the others said the exact opposite. Yah did to Joshua and Caleb what they said and the others also got what they said. Let me close with our beloved Yeshua's own words from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7.7 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened for you. And then later, Matthew 12, 36 through 37. But I tell you that every wordless word that they speak, people will give an account for it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be vindicated, and by your words you will be condemned. Mm. To summarize, at the core of Moses' disobedience was lack of faith. It was Moses' thoughtless words and not him striking the rock that was the problem. Yah revealed to Moses a spiritual law concerning the words that he speaks. This spiritual law applies across the board to all the people as well as the leadership. Yah told Moses that words have authority and power behind them and that he will do whatever you say. Yah's message to us is clear. He listens to what we say and that he does to us whatever we say. If we speak evil, that is what we will get. If we speak good things, that is what we will get. Our words have authority and power behind them. They affect our out outcome and what we get. So now I finally understand what my grandma meant when she said, Child, always be careful of what you say. Whatever your mouth utters out, a voice in heaven will say, and so it is. Thank Very you. good. Very good. What I want to say to that is, I found it interesting, a good reminder that Yah told Moshe and Aaron to go bless the people. And so that's what they should have been doing. It should have been positive and nothing negative. And Moses comes out and says, you rebels. <laughs> just He was just so ticked off. Just We read so many times how they come to him complaining, and he just infuriates him but yeah he was not to do that and it's a powerful message that 
we have to be very careful with our words, what we say about ourselves, what we say about others. That whole negative, positive concept that we see these motivational speakers, you know, getting hired to talk about it, it's in the scriptures. We should be talking with positive words and blessings and not letting these negative things take us over and speak them. Because we're, if we speak them into existence, they become. And that's what we have to be careful. And that's why we are told to repent verbally and physically and turning away, confessing and turning away from those things. So there's power in the words, but those words come with intent. So this whole message is great. It also, it goes back to the many proverbs that are written about words, speech, gossip, the whole slander of the tongue, all of these other concepts that, that are wrapped with the voice, the tongue, the mouth, speech, etc. And I love it. It just made me think of all those uh, <laughs> when I listened you. to you on that about, about the power of our words and the implications of what will happen with our words. I hope that everyone could hear you. I kept worrying. I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> so too. But thank you everyone. It sounded, it sounded amazing. I That was just fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, thank fantastic. you, Stephanie. Any thoughts on Moses? And did anyone not realize it? about Moses not making it to the promised land was because of his words, or did they think it was striking the rock? I never heard that before, and it makes total sense now. Great. Total sense. I wanted to call my mom and get her to, to chime in, but she had trouble finding Discord before, and so I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll definitely be sharing that. Um, I also agree with you, Sunny, today. I, it was amazing. I always thought it was because he just was disobedient and yes. he struck the rock. I didn't think it was because of his words that he was actually speaking a curse to the people. Yep. And I know that our words are so powerful, but this went even deeper and made a bigger impact. I am amazed at the study. I want to share it with others. It was incredible. Uh, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, and it's amazing when we had the chapter reading the blessing in chapter 33, almost in every verse he, he referred to Yah as the rock. Mm. Almost every verse in chapter 33 is calling Yah the rock. Well, I've always known about power of words and how being positive and instead of us focusing on the problem, we should focus on the solution. But I had I don't think heard it the way that you presented it. It was powerful and it just and I never I just didn't think of it in that way. Told that was the whole reason why he didn't enter the promised land was not giving the blessing. And our words I never thought of it the way you said that your grandma that the that you speak it was spoken by someone in heaven. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. amazing. I was like, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I must admit, I didn't understand what she's telling me until I started connecting dots and then it came back to me after so many years that I didn't think about it. So when I had the inspiration, I just had a, a huge inspiration two weeks ago when I was preparing for the sermon and I was getting ready Every time when I read the last two chapters of Deuteronomy, I literally cry because I feel so sad for Moses. Since I was a child, I always took it very hard. And this time I thought I'm going to pray and get some answers so I have peace. And that's the inspiration that I had. Bernice, I have to say, I was very humbled by those words. It was a very powerful study. It really lets you know the words that he was speaking of. I hate your new moons and your feast. And it's not that he hates that. He hated the grumbling and the strife among the brethren. And, and those words that we say. And just to have peace with each other. Anyway, it was just powerful. I was very humbled by it. And totally relate to Moses. I I traded with the people myself. And but we have to shut up the zipix and just go on. That's, Thank you. Oh sorry. Good. At our women retreat, we had one of our sessions a few weeks ago was about gossip. 
yes. in the community. And, yes. and we hear this all the time and, and we, we ponder and we think of ourselves and the things that we've said since the last time we felt convicted about gossip, but this really hit home. I love this 106 nugget that you found as well. And Nick and Pam were saying like, just the murmuring and complaining and everything. It's not just gossip. It's not just what you say about others. It's what you say to them and what you speak out loud. And that was just really powerful. Thank you. Yes, agreed. I oh, sorry, Renee, it's Sonny here. I just want to just say, I'm so emotional from that. I've always, I had um, when we had missionary couple that we knew. My husband knew them in the Philippines. He's from the, my husband's from the Philippines, and they were missionaries all over the Far East. And after I married my husband, we were in the Navy, and we got stationed in Guam. I didn't know them until we moved to Guam, and there they were. After they'd been missionaries all over the Far East, they ended up being missionaries in Guam. At the time, I was a newly married woman. Had, then had a new baby and my, you know, in the Navy myself and my husband in the Navy and I needed parents and father, there they were. So I adopted them as my mom and dad, called them mom and dad. His name was Goose for all my life ever since I met them. They always talk, talk, told me how powerful our words are. And they tried to get it across to me that even though you are tired and you feel, you know, so good, don't speak that. Because what your words are speaking, that's what will happen to you. And I, and after hearing you talking about this, Ronit, it's just hammer back in what they were saying all those years ago. Wow. It's, it's, it is, our words are just so powerful. Mm -hmm. Speak blessings, not cursing. Anytime that we, sp we speak negative about anybody, like when we are complaining or just talking to our best girlfriend and we're talking to them about... Oh, well, my husband did that and that, that's wrong because we are speaking negative about them. We're just grumbling and complaining about the faults we see in them instead of speaking praise and up, upright, praising positive words about them. So, yeah, so it just brings it full, all the way back full, full circle to me. Yeah. Yes. Amen. And another thing that was mentioned is about the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons of God.